<laughs> Good evening. Um, thank you very much, Pamela, for that long, beautiful introduction. And also, uh, thank you to the American Academy Berlin. Um, I was very surprised the morning I received the phone call to come here. It's funny how your work can take you to really unexpected places. And I've learned over the years to just follow where your work guides you. And so it's been a real um, honor and a, and a blessing to actually be here and to be amongst the type of fellows that are here and to just be able to learn so much uh, from, from the fellows and also to make a cross-cultural connection to Berlin, since Berlin has a very interesting history. And I feel like there is a lot that I can learn from here that's in Berlin to help me continue to unpack some of the concerns I have at home in Braddock, Pennsylvania. So uh, the way that I do my work is through narrative live performance. I don't specifically talk at each image. I kind of perform through narrative with them. So you'll be kind of challenged to listen to what I'm saying, but also to look at the visual language of the work as well. So I want to start out um, first by acknowledging my, my family, my colleagues, and residents at home in Braddock, Pennsylvania, and for those who are watching live stream. My mentors, my very first mentors, are my grandmother and my mother. Without their brave courage and generosity um, and con contribution as collaborators, the work wouldn't exist, and I wouldn't exist, and I wouldn't be here today. So I'm very thankful to my mother and my grandmother. Uh, it is also important that I acknowledge the mentors and artists that have influenced my practice and career. So in 2000, I met Kathy Kowalski at Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. Kathy taught me to honor the neglected and underrepresented people. She committed her whole photographic practice to photographing women in prison, to photographing families living in rural poverty in areas such as Erie, Pennsylvania, which is where Edinburgh was located. She also photographed her mother and how uh, the type of care that comes for a single elder person, how it's lacking in our society. So Kathy introduced me to writers like Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks came to visit us three times. She introduced me to essays by Roland Bartz, Susan Sontag, to works by artists Carrie Mae Weems, Larry Clark, Eugene Richards, the Farm Security Administration, in particular Gordon Parks, Dorothea Lange, Walker <coughs> Evans, and we read repeatedly James Adgey and Walker Evans' Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Unexpectedly, Kathy passed in 2006 from lymphoma cancer but her work can be found today in the permanent collection at the Erie Art Museum in Erie, Pennsylvania. My next mentor is Doug Dubois. I met Doug in 2002 at a portfolio review where he took a keen interest in the work that I was already producing as a teenager. Then I attended Syracuse University in 2004 under his guidance. Doug taught me the difference between making pictures versus taking pictures. As you can see, this very powerful portrait that he's made of his own mother. Uh, he spent a great deal of his practice photographing the split of his parents and uh, the decline of their health and aging and loss. Doug introduced me to works by his mentors, which were Larry Sultan and Mitch Epstein. He also introduced me to works by Richard Billingham and Nick Woplington. And he introduced me to Carrie Mae Weems. Uh, Doug is a 2013 Guggenheim Fellow, and his first book, All the Days and Nights, were published uh, by Aperture Foundation in 2009.
So in 2005, I meet Carrie Mae Weems at Syracuse University, and I began studying in her course, Social Studies 101, Community Art Practice. Carrie taught me how to question and challenge history. Carrie introduced me to performances and community projects by artists Coco Fusco, Rick Lowe Project Row Houses, and Tim Rollins in KOS. She also introduced me to the writings by David Harvey. She's the 2013 MacArthur, MacArthur Genius Fellow, and in 2014 is the first African American to receive a retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum. Carrie Mae Weems' Three Decades of Photography and Video is now on view at the Guggenheim until May 14th. In 2008, I met Dawood Bey at the Center for Photography Woodstock. Today, Dawood and I have conversations about classic and contemporary portraiture and the historical significance of social documentary work. The historical uh, new series of an image that you see here is entitled The Birmingham Project. It commemorates four black girls killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, when the Ku Klux Klan members bombed the church. You can learn about this series in the 2014 Whitney Biennial, which opens today, and it runs through May 25th. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge Ron Clark. In 2010, I met him at the Whitney Museum of American Art Independent Study Program. Ron introduced me to theorists and artists such as Stuart Hall, David Harvey, Hans Hacke, Martha Rossler, Alan Sekula, Alfredo Yar, and Benjamin Buclo, who through four very intense seminars, introduced me to critical writings by Sieg Siegfried Krakauer, Walter Benjamin, Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, and Bertolt Brecht. And that was the board that kind of shows you the type of rigorous schedule we had under Ron Clark. And so tonight, uh, as Pamela stated, and I'll restate this again, the focus of my lecture tonight is the importance of documentary photography today, the process of how documentary work represents invisible realities, and the importance of cultural memory found in the industrial heritage of my homeland, Braddock, Pennsylvania. In 2009, I went to the Braddock Carnegie Library the first Andrew Carnegie Library built in 1888. I purchased this book, Images of America, Braddock, Allegheny County. I took the book to my studio, excited to, to learn about the many men and women that migrated from Scotland, Ireland, Germany, Russia, Italy, even Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Africa. And by the time I turned to the last page, I realized that all African Americans that contributed to this great history were excluded. If Arcadia published Images of America, Braddock, Allegheny County in 2008, and Dr. Dennis C. Dickerson, my fellow companion that's out here in the audience as a fellow this year, um, who was also an African-American steel worker from this same period himself, released his research out of the crucible, Black Steel Workers in Western Pennsylvania, 1875 to 1980, 22 years prior to Arcadia's book, with proof that in the 1890s there were 213 Black steel employees, how could African-Americans be overlooked? If Arcadia published Images of America, Braddock, Allegheny County in 2008 again, and Braddock's legendary filmmaker, Tony Buba, 
and historical activist Ray Henderson, both whom were also still workers, produced this award-winning documentary film, Struggles in Still, a story of African-American still workers, 12 years prior to Arcadia's book, How Could the Legacy of Black American Men and Women That Worked in the Steel Mills Be Erased from the History Pages of Braddock, PA in the 21st Century? Stuart Hall created a campaign against racism in the media. In 1979, on a BBC broadcast, Hall critiqued how racism is disseminated in popular culture. He states, racism never has been put in a critical context by the media in this country. When it comes to fighting racism, the media are part of the problem. They perpetuate myths and stereotypes about black people. They lie by omission, distortion, and selection. They give racist inflated importance and respectability. So for 12 years, I've been creating documentary art and multidisciplinary forms of photography, video, and performance that are collaborations between my family and community. Core themes in my work are the body and landscape, familial and communal history, private and public space, American history, and social activism. So the triptych that you see here, which I've labeled for you, John Frazier, who existed before the camera, mm -hmm. me, I'm in the middle, dressed as my grandmother's best, and Andrew <laughs> Carnegie. These are raster etched aluminum plates mounted on wood. The plates of John Fraser and Andrew Carnegie are appropriated from the book, Allegheny County Images of, of Braddock. And um, the, the image, what, what's important to me about this image is visually inserting myself between these two great figures creates a new kind of plaque that questions the visibility and value of women that have been consistently omitted from the grand narrative of the steel mill industry, of Braddock PA's history, and from American history. It is said that by the 1920s, Braddock was a vast melting pot of approximately 20,000 inhabitants. Culturally, I am a descendant of the Scottish, African, Bradonian, steel mill working class, and I embrace this heritage. Braddock sits in western Pennsylvania, approximately nine miles outside of Pittsburgh, along the ancient path of the Monongahela River. A historical industrial suburb, it is home to Andrew Carnegie's first steel mill, the Ecker Thompson Works, which is the last functioning steel mill in the region, and it was established in 1872. A sewer, a drain, a place for throwing waste. Similar to W.E.B. Du Bois, I too was born by a golden river and a shadow of two great hills. Fourth generation in a lineage of women, I was raised under the protection and care of my grandma Ruby off 8th Street at 805 Washington Avenue. The shadow from the steel mill always hovered above us. Like a historical timeline, Grandma Ruby, Mom, and myself grew up in significantly different social and economic climates. Grandma Ruby witnessed Braddock's prosperous days of department stores, theaters, and restaurants. Mom witnessed the steel mills close and white flight to suburban developments. 
I witnessed the war on drugs decimate my family and community. Between our three generations, we not only witnessed, we experienced and internalized the end of industrialization and the rise of gentrification. Looking both inwardly and outwardly, I desire to move beyond boundaries. <coughs> Similar to Annie, Lucy, and Zuella, heroines from a Jamaica Kincaid novel, I am in search of a new space, place, and time. There is a tight pressure and sharp piercing pain in my chest. The lack of deep sleep has not worn off. I feel a sense of imbalance. The haze that forms the sky are from millions of tiny particles that pass through my lungs and into my bloodstream. Like carbon monoxide, they are odorless and have the potential to kill. Grandma Ruby's husband died on mom's first birthday left to raise six children during the 60s could not have been an easy task. She worked for goodwill. Grandma Ruby internalized the idea that black women aren't supposed to cry. They're to remain silent and endure suffering. Like the women in Julia Margaret Cameroon's portraits, she is the divine mother figure. Mm -hmm. Mom was playing her 45 records. She put on her favorite song, Girls' Night Out, by Taylor Collins, because it was our night to go out drinking. It's irritating when you put that camera in my face. Why do you like taking pictures of me? Because it's my way of accepting you as you are and gaining back all the time we lost. The shutter clicked. Then we switched places. I asked her, what do you see when you look at me? She looked through the viewfinder and said, I see a lot of me in you. It's like your loss, like you don't have nobody. But right now, you don't understand. She paused and made a picture of me. The main street was Braddock Avenue. Grandma Ruby always described it. There used to be three theaters, the Capitol, Paramount, and the Times. There were restaurants, five and 10 stores, children's stores, and furniture stores. Oh, we used to have everything. By the 1980s, when my generation walked the streets, most of the steel mills were closed, and there was nothing left except 12 bars, three jitney stations, <coughs> Bell's Meat Market, Stamboli's Fish Market, the Pawn Shop, and Braddock News, and one restaurant, which was the cafeteria in Braddock Hospital. They are in every room of the house, sitting at the table, on her couches, standing on the mantle above the fireplace. Lately, I wonder if her compulsive collecting has anything to do with her lacking close relationships with her real children. These are my children, my babies, she would say, as she groomed them in chain-smoked Pall Malls. I, too, became part of her collection. I was a porcelain doll she kept locked away in a glass case until she decided to take me out and exhibit me. You are one of my dolls. I dressed you like a baby doll because I wanted to. Everybody saw you. You were so cute. I wore a big light blue dress that had ruffles and lace around it. 
with a fluffy white slip underneath that made it look full. She put a part in the middle of my head and put two large twist pigtails with light blue ribbons and white hair bollies wrapped around them. She made me wear white stockings and baby doll shoes. When I outgrew grandma's dresses, she would always say, I want to smash you back into a little doll. He is my rival for mom's affection. Detached and numb, he reminded me of Stan, the father from Charles Burnett's film, Killer of Sheep. Working menial wage jobs is exhausting. It's never enough to build a foundation. Reminiscent of August Wilson's play Fences, we erected barriers all around us. We exist in an internal and external world. When you are gone, who will be my comforter? Mom's American cheeseburger is a symbol for love. If the woman in Vermeer's painting, Lady with a Jug, is the guardian of the domestic and has the power to resist and transmute the murderous onslaughts of history, then Mom has a lot she has to juggle. She's a prisoner in her own home. Gramps always wore his suit and bow tie with a fedora, suspenders, and alligator shoes. Every time he saw me, he would say, hello, doll, and give me a napkin filled with candy. The sugar-coated orange slices and Snickers were my favorite. Gramps worked in Andrew Carnegie's steel mill, the Ecker Thompson Works. Once he retired, he collected his pension. He always voted Republican. African American men like Gramps worked hard labor and high temperatures tearing down and rebuilding furnaces, cleaning up spilt metal and slag. Once hard labor consumed his body, it was discarded and thrown away. I couldn't take the pounding and screaming any longer, nor the stench of human decay. Gramps died in his bed on Thanksgiving. Family secrets, hidden history, and constant silence defined our coexistence. Opposite of Francesca Woodman, I found my face. In their 2010 global ad campaign, advertisement agency Wyden and Kennedy and clothing company Levi Strauss <coughs> branded Braddock as the new frontier for urban pioneers to 
go forth proclaiming everybody's work is equally important. It was hard. If she would live to be old as Methuen, mm -hmm. you never got out the room. But, uh, understand what room service is. You was hired in a certain department. That's where all your promotional sequence was. It was in that department. I got, I got tired of it. I said, I'm going to do somebody to say, I went to E.B. Rich. E.B. I said, I like Bill Who was Rich. Rich? He was a union man. Uh, he was chairman of the Greens Committee at that time. He told me, he said, if I put you up in that claim, so they bought my house tomorrow. But then I got really interested in the crane. I liked the way I used to watch them do in the stockyard. They had a coordination. Two or three cranes would unload the, the railroad cars and swing it back and, uh, and load the charging boxes. And it was, it was a team effort. And that fascinated me. I said, well, shoot, that's what I like. So I pursued that daily. I used to go to work maybe an hour early in order to see what they did down the line. And as I walked down the line, I would see the man, how they use their hands. And I always, then I would go back and ask the boss, can I get a job at the maintenance department? And um, so um, they said, well, we ain't hiring. I said, well, you're not hiring. Well, not, you can't prove that. So the only way you could find out that is to be what you call John on the spot. I used to go to work every day. And if I seen a new face, I go back tell the man, you know, you got a and met up and they would say, nah. So that went on for, I guess, maybe a year or two, you know. But I never gave it up. So it happened one day, I went to work and I went and I told them, you got new men up on the crane. So this is, I, I can't remember the foreman's name, Scotty, Scotty something. So he said, well, you go down and get on the general crane. But I knew in the training, they always send someone to show you something, which just didn't happen. But I went and got on the general crane. Only thing helped me by going each and every day. I know they did this hand for this. I'm serious about this, man. And it helped me. But I guess within two or three weeks, by me um, eating, sleeping, praying, I became as good as anybody. Seriously, I was determined, and I did it. How did a, a worker have to qualify for these jobs? Did well, you take a test. Take a test. They had a test for them. They had a they test did. For, yeah, they had a test for them. They had a test because that's how we got a uh, black maintenance man, Mike Don Mike Ivory. That's how he got it. But the only reason he got it because his name was Mike Ivory, and they thought he was white. But after he passed the test, they didn't give it to him. That's true. That is true. That is very true. Now the test that Ralph Johnson had to go through, he should have been driving a rocket ship because. They put a little bucket down, a little teapot down there, put them up on the crane, and give them one try to come down with the boom, or the horse, whatever you want to call it, and put it in the bucket. Yeah. One try. One try. But Ralph was lucky. He came down the first time, and then that damn thing go in the bucket. Right in the bucket it went, and they almost dropped over. Now, now they, he passed every test, now they had to give him the Kramer life. So what happened is I bid it on a job on the marking tables where there were no blacks previous. Mm -hmm. okay? And there was some things said that there wouldn't be no blacks on this, these tables as long as I'm here or whatever, whatever. So whenever the job came up for bid, they told me, well, you didn't get that job. Uh, they had a guy older than me. I said, fine, that's no problem. So I went back to cutting scrap again. I was cutting scrap on number one. That made me the oldest scrap man. So when the job came up for roller helper, they were down there discussing it in the shanty one day, who was going to be the next roller helper? 
And somebody said, it's going to be Pat Proud because he's Irish. I said, it's going to be an Irishman to get it. I said, but it won't be Pat. I said, it's going to be me. I'm going to get the job. I said, you're going to start calling me O. Moorfield from now on. <laughs> <laughs> She would shout her nicknames while she was in bed. Midgey, Pee Wee, Cookie, Toy. Sometimes she would call on the Lord. The doctor told us that if he operated on her, there would only be a 15% chance it would go away. Grandma Ruby waited a few days. I supported her decision. Between my background and my foreground, I am not sure where I stand. For now, we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim, blurred reflection of reality as in a riddle or enigma. <coughs> but then when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. The apparition is me. We are not in Manet's bar at the Folies Bergerie. She is trapped in the phase with one of her multiple personalities. Could be Missouri or maybe Marcia. We don't have names for them all. We will definitely have a blackout. It was Sunday. January 18th, disoriented, I stumbled to the bathroom floor. I started taking deep breaths, hyperventilating, gasping for air. Mom was calling. She told me she was complaining about chest pains, that she couldn't breathe. I tried to lay back down. She lives two blocks away from the hospital. It took them three hours to get her there. 9.15 PM, third quarter, Steelers, Ravens game. Mom called again. She said she could not breathe. There was too much fluid in her lungs. Her heart overworked from pumping for oxygen. She could see gramps. Her organs failed. They covered her body with a white sheet and left her there. Don't worry, toy. I'll tell you when. Across a hard metal counter, she laid there. Her head was propped up. Her lips were glued shut. Her skin looked thin and smooth. She looked like a porcelain doll. While the Steelers celebrated victory and Obama danced with Michelle, I clutched onto the handle with two hands. The rubber from my sneakers kept slipping on the wet snow. I clenched my teeth. In my mind, I could hear her say, you better not drop me, toy. I stepped up over the plot. The funeral director instructed me to slowly kneel and release the handles. My side was off. I pushed the coffin until it was straight. 6 hours later I turned 27 and a part of my soul went with her We spent many mornings and afternoons drinking coffee in the gift shop Her favorite shortcut was taking the lower level elevator from Braddock Avenue up to the main lobby on Holland Avenue Grandma Ruby passed away in UPMC Braddock Hospital 
January 18th, 2009, at 9.15 p.m. Braddock Hospital served our community from June 27th, 1906 to January 31st, 2010. Braddock Hospital merged with University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in 1996. In October 2009, the community found out that UPMC chose to close our hospital <coughs> due to claims it was losing money and was underutilized. <coughs> Braddock Council President Jesse Brown challenged the UPMC decision to abandon our town. The Office for Civil Rights of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services conducted an investigation. The final settlement, settlement allocated shuttles to health care services in a nearby neighborhood for outpatient service and extended hours at the Braddock Family Health Center. Braddock Hospital was our largest employer. Today, our community does not have adequate health care, emergency care, or employment opportunities. UPMC demolished our historical six-story hospital and built a new hospital, UPMC East, in an affluent suburb that a majority of our community residents cannot reach. UPMC is an $8 billion nonprofit with a tax exempt status that pays its CEO a base salary of $4.3 million. Today, UPMC has facilities in Ireland, Italy, United Kingdom, Kazakhstan, Singapore, China, and Japan, with more global developments to come. Blessed are the poor, the meek, and the afflicted. Better is the little that the uncompromisingly righteous have than the abundance of possessions of many who are wrong and wicked. And I'll close out by pointing at what's happening there currently. So here you have where the former hospital used to be, it's now been replaced by dozens of homes that are supposedly affordable, and they're moving families in there. But the question is, if there's been a steel mill pumping out toxicity since 1872, and there's no hospital or no emergency facility or any type of clinic in the town, what good does it do to put homes in that place instead of finding a way to get us a hospital back? And you'll see here, this is where they built um, apartments for the elderly citizens so they could cross over a bridge to get into the hospital. UPMC knew they were going to demolish this around the same period that this was built. And so there are elder citizens living in these apartments right now that still don't have access to health care. Another thing that I want to point out is the treatment that's happening to African Americans that are still trying to hold on to the homes that they have worked hard for and earned. This house here belongs to the Bunn family. There is a wonderful man there that has withstood a lot of the discrimination and racism that black men have been facing since the beginning of this town's development, and his name is Isaac Bunn. But if you'll notice here that they've put these plastic bags around their house because they refuse to leave, they're considered holdouts, when in reality I see them as American citizens that his father worked in the mill and died from his job-related injuries in the mill. His mother is a social worker that has now fallen ill. And this home has been in their family for more than four generations. Since they won't leave, they decided 
to let another industrial company put these bags there. And what's in the bags are rubber tires. And they're recycled rubber tires from trucks. And if we were to go home and look up what that means, if rubber was to catch on fire, you can't contain it or put it out. And it would kill them by releasing additional toxins. So you can see the magnitude of the discrimination and environmental racism that the Bunn family is now facing because they won't leave the home that they worked and died for for generations. I'd also like to point out that along here were hundreds of more houses, just like Isaac's house. My great-grandmother owned a laundromat and a, a little shop. Uh, Gramps, who you saw in the earlier photographs, owned a home and he lived there. My mother was raised here. And this area is called The Bottom. And this is because it was right next to Carnegie's Mill. But this is also the same bottom where everyone who immigrated from Russia, Germany, Italy, at some point, you all lived there. And the irony is that African Americans were never permitted to move up the hill like everyone else. We were redlined to this block. And today, they want to redline us out of it. And so this is the last image. I'll stop here. But you can see right here symbolically of what my task is and what my beliefs are in terms of using the camera to fight against years of poverty and environmental racism and discrimination against working class people. It's not just a black and white issue. This is an assault on working class people, on poor people, on immigrants, on elderly citizens who can't fend for themselves, and on single parent households. The last thing I'll mention here is that this industrial development also happened to be a project high rise that I grew up in when I was born in 1982. In the late 80s, a family, the Saunders family, filed a lawsuit against Allegheny County for discrimination against African Americans for keeping us down here with all this toxicity. What ended up happening is that um, the settlement caused Pittsburgh and Allegheny County to have to kind of disperse all of us throughout different boroughs in Allegheny County to fight, to fight against, um, basically for desegregation. But none of us ever received any monetary money or any type of support. So that means generation after generation, we inherited a debt, but we also inherited terminal illnesses. So I will stop here and I'll answer any questions or thoughts or ideas or criticisms you may have. And um, I guess we could turn up the lights.